We've been in a series on, uh, called You Too Can Be Happy. Everybody say, God wants me to be happy. You know, we've, and I've, I've mentioned in this series that, that a lot of times we put so much emphasis on joy. And as preachers, we, you know, because joy is one of the fruit of the Spirit. And I've even heard preachers say, you know, God never promised that you could be, that you need to be happy. He just wants you to have joy. I've actually heard those words come out of some preachers' mouths. I don't agree with that. But we have kind of overemphasized, I, I won't say overemphasized because you can't overemphasize joy. But we've kind of downplayed happiness. Uh, at the at the expense of our emphasis on joy, Comp- uh, yeah, I believe to be balanced does not mean to compromise. You don't downplay one for another. You go in in the full direction of of all truth, and so that's that's what it means to be balanced. I don't take away something so that something else can be glorified. Uh, I go in both directions. You know, uh, God wants us to have joy. He wants us to be happy. Amen. So happiness is part of the equation too. But happiness is governed by joy. We shouldn't allow just our circumstances of life to govern our happiness. And if we're not careful, that's what we do. That's what the world does. You know, the, the world, that's why we have Blue Monday. And, uh, you know, it, 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 everybody talks, well, it's Monday. I expect everybody to be down. I expect everybody to be irritated. It's a full moon. So, you know, all the crazy people are out. And, and that may, there may be some truth to some of those things in the world, but we're not in the world. Well, we're in the world, but we're not of the world. Amen. Everybody say, I'm in, I'm in the world, but not of the world. Of the and so God wants us to be happy. But happiness is a learned behavior. Uh, first of all, in John chapter 10, verse 10, Jesus is speaking, and he says, The thief does not come except to steal and to kill and to destroy. I have come that they might have life and that they may have it more abundantly. So Jesus makes it real clear that the devil's the one that comes to steal and take away from us. Jesus came to give us life and give us an abundance of life. Part of having an abundant life is being happy. Now, we need to be careful that we don't base our happiness on how much we have. Amen? Amen. Uh, Paul wrote in Philippians, I'm not going to review a long time because I want to have time to cover some things here. Philippians, let's see here if I can get to it. Here we go. Philippians chapter 4, verse 4 says rejoice. Everybody say rejoice. In the Lord when? Always. Always. Again, I will say rejoice. Now, there's a biblical principle that when the Bible repeats itself, it's for emphasis. I said, when the Bible repeats itself, it's for emphasis. Amen. <laughs> Anyone who's married understands that. When your husband or your wife starts repeating themselves, it's because they want you to hear it. Right? right. Yeah. And I've learned that Rachel is not always just talking just to talk. There, I mean, there's, there, I need to listen. Amen? Amen. She's, she's the better part of me. Amen? And so I need to listen. Husbands would be wise to listen to their wives. and wi- uh, husband, Husbands would be wise to listen to their wives. Wives would be wise to listen to their husbands. We need one another, and we walk together. And so when the Bible repeats itself, it's to emphasize a point. Rejoice in the Lord when? And again, I will say, Rejoice. In every situation, we need to learn the secret of rejoicing. Now, not every situation is of God. So we don't thank God for everything, but we thank God in everything. Amen? God doesn't make us sick. I don't thank God for sickness, but I thank God while I'm sick. I thank God for healing. I thank God for provision. Amen? And so rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I will say rejoice. Let your gentleness be uh, known to all men. The Lord is at hand. Be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication. With thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. In other words, don't worry about anything, but pray about everything. Amen. And I know some people say, well, I have more, uh, more of an anxious personality. 
Well, that may be true in, in the flesh, but we're not in the flesh anymore. We're in it, but we're not of the flesh. We're of the Spirit of God. And so we can listen to the Holy Spirit in our lives and yield ourselves to that instead of yielding ourselves to the ebb and flow of the world's way of doing things. Because the world will drive you nuts. Amen? Amen. I mean, if you just follow your circumstances, it's a roller coaster ride and it's not fun. But God wants us to have an evenness to our life. He wants us to be even on a plane of joy and happiness. Amen? And so don't worry about anything, but pray about everything with thanksgiving. Let your request be known to God. With thanksgiving. Everybody say, with thanksgiving. In other words, we pray in hope. We pray in faith, which operates by hope. Amen? A lot of times we, we emphasize faith, but we forget that faith is the substance of things hoped for. So you have to have hope in order to keep your faith. Our hope is always in Jesus. No matter what you're going through, God has the answer for your problems. Amen? I've been through a lot. You've been through a lot. The longer I live, the more I understand that God always has a way out. God always has a way of provision. It may not be what I thought it was going to be, may not be how I thought it was going to be, but God is always faithful. Amen? Everybody say, God is always faithful. So I can always have hope in Jesus. Jesus came with a promise. We have a better covenant based on better promises. When there's promises, promises give you hope. I promise we're going to have lunch this afternoon at my house. Hallelujah. So there's hope. Amen? Amen. So where there's a promise, there's hope. Where there's hope, there can be faith. So there's a, that we have the promise of Jesus, the promise of the Word of God. All the promises of God are yes and amen. And we have promises from Him. That gives us hope. Where hope is, we can have faith. Finally, brethren, verse 8, whatever things are true, whatever things are noble, whatever things are just, whatever things are pure, Whatever things are lovely, whatever things are of good report, if there's any virtue, and if there's anything praiseworthy, meditate or think on these things. God even tells us how we need to think. If we're not careful, we can let our thoughts wander down to the lowest level. That's what worry is. Worrying is just simply allowing your thoughts to dwell on the problem instead of the solution. All of us are going to have problems. I've got problems. Tosh, you got problems. Everybody's got problems. Amen? Mm -hmm. But we can't dwell on our problems. We have to dwell on the solution, the promise. Amen? And if we do that, the things which you have learned and received and heard of me, verse 9, these do, and the God of peace will be with you. Everybody say peace. So God wants us to have peace. But I rejoice in the Lord greatly that now at last your care for me has flourished again, though you surely did care, but you lacked opportunity. Verse 11, not that I speak in regard to need, for I have learned, everybody say, I have learned, in whatever state or whatever condition I'm in, to be content. Paul said, I have learned how to be happy in any situation. So happiness or contentment is a learned behavior. If, you, if you're not living on the level of learning how to be happy, then you're just allowing happiness to come and go as circumstances come and go. And that's okay, but there's a better way. God wants us to be happy all the time. You, Paul, you got to understand, Paul wrote over half the New Testament. He was in prison much of the time that he wrote that. And here, Paul writing much of this from prison. Now, I don't know about you, but I somehow think prison is probably not the most pleasant thing, especially in those days. It wasn't like the United States of America where prisoners have rights. I mean, they lived in, in I mean, sometimes I've heard 
and read accounts, some of the prisons that he was in were prisons that were all, all kind of under underground. And when it was rainy, rainy season and things like that, they'd be flooded. Human waste all inside the, the cell. I mean, I, it, we're not talking about, you know, clean conditions. We're talking about nasty, filthy, horrible conditions. And that's just what they were living, the environment they were living. Then you, you add to that the punishment, the persecution, the beatings, the, the, the way they were treated was horrible. Amen? And yet Paul said, I have learned in whatever state I'm in to be content. Here's a man that knew what he was talking about. So if Paul can say that from prison, then our little light problems, we can learn to be happy. Amen? Everybody say, I have to learn how to be happy. And so Jesus came in the New Testament. We talked about how that Jesus came and, and preached what we call the Sermon on the Mount. And in Matthew chapter 5, Jesus came after being tempted of the devil in the wilderness and overcame temptation in the wilderness. He came out, led of the Spirit, and began to proclaim the kingdom of God. And the Bible says in Matthew chapter 5, let's see here, verse 1. This is all review. And seeing the multitudes, he went up to, on a mountain. And when he was settled, seated, his disciples came to him. Then he opened his mouth and taught them, saying. Now this is what we call the Sermon on the Mount. The, the first transcribed sermon that Jesus preached. And the first word and the first sermon that he preached was the word blessed. Everybody say blessed. blessed. Everybody say I am blessed. I am blessed. The word blessed l also means happy. Everybody say blessed. blessed. Say happy. happy. So you could say happy are the poor in spirit for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And you list all what we call the, the Beatitudes. And so religion has taken these statements that Jesus made, what we call the Beatitudes, and taken them to say that you need to be poor in spirit so, so that you can be blessed. That you need to be poor in spirit, that, that the, the condition is the blessing. That when you're poor in spirit, that you're blessed because you're poor in spirit. No, I believe what Jesus is saying here, he lists a lot of conditions that there are provisions for. The blessing is not the condition, the blessing is the provision. Blessed are the poor in spirit, because theirs is the kingdom of heaven. The blessing is not the poverty of spirit. The blessing is the kingdom of heaven. Amen? So, and it's, I believe that he, he said this on purpose. I don't, Jesus, I don't think Jesus said anything by accident. He created the whole world with the word. Amen? Words mean something. And the first word he said was the word blessed. Everybody say it again, blessed. blessed. Happy. Amen. God wants us to be happy. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Everybody is poor in spirit until they come to Jesus. With this one statement, he included everybody in the world. Blessed are the poor in spirit. That's everybody. Amen. That's you. That's me. That's everyone before we came to Jesus. We were all poor in spirit. Amen? What did he say? I'm providing the kingdom of heaven. Jesus came to bless us with the kingdom of heaven. We're no longer living simply in the kingdom of this world. We're living in the kingdom of heaven. Amen? Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And then he said, blessed are those who mourn. Everybody say blessed. Blessed, blessed are those who mourn. When you mourn something, you've lost something. You've lost someone. You've lost something. Amen? And we've all lost things. We've all lost loved ones. And we mourn when that happens. Jesus said they're blessed. The blessing is not the loss. The blessing is the comfort. Amen? And if we'll learn to follow the teachings of Jesus and live and learn how to be happy, we learn that comfort. Amen? And it's something we can't explain. It's something that you can't understand. I mean, you know, when, when you lose someone that you love so much, it, it hurts. But there's a, a peace that comes for only from the Holy Spirit. 
I've preached funerals of people that lost children that they were not saved. They were not born again. They didn't know Jesus. And there was no comfort for them. There was nothing I could say to help them. I kept trying to tell them, God didn't, steal, God didn't kill your baby. And they were so mad at God. They were so hurt. They were so angry. Understandably so, because they don't know Jesus. And the way the world thinks is that God kills everybody and you know, God gives life. He takes it away. Listen, God doesn't kill our babies. Amen? Amen? The fact is we're living in a fallen world. We're living in a world where bad things happen. And sometimes to good people. Amen? Amen? But we need to learn that God didn't give us that. God gives us comfort. Amen? Amen? We're blessed when we lose something, not because we've lost something, but because God gives us the comfort and the peace and the, the ability to go on. Amen? And it takes a little bit of time sometimes because we have to adjust to that. But God gives us the comfort. Amen? Then we're blessed. The next one was blessed are the meek or happy are the meek. You know, meek people are people that, that you know, you'd think, well, they just let people walk all over them. But the, the provision is they shall inherit the earth. Amen? Well, that takes boldness. God gives us the boldness to overcome even when we're meek. Amen? Then last week we talked about blessed are those who hunger and thirst after righteousness. You know, hunger and thirst is a need. Amen? And it says they shall be filled. Everybody say, I am filled. I am filled. And we talked about that last week. God, God has given us the gift of righteousness. Righteousness is not something that we do. It's something that we receive from God. I've been made righteous, so naturally I begin to do righteous things. Amen? Before I got born again, I did not do righteous things. After I got saved, I naturally began to do righteous things. I didn't work to get saved. I got saved, and then I automat God started changing me. Amen? I'm not, I haven't arrived yet, but I'm not where I was. And I'm getting better. Amen? Amen. Everybody say, I'm getting better. See, we're on a road that leads to a destination. We haven't arrived yet, but we're farther along down the road than we used to be. At least we ought to be. Amen? Righteousness is not what we do. It's who we are. And so because of that, we do. And then we talk about blessed are the merciful. Everybody say, blessed are the merciful. Blessed are the merciful. Now, you don't need to be merciful until you've been done wrong. So this is describing a condition of somebody that's been done wrong. Amen? If Vernon has never done me wrong, I, I don't need to show him any mercy. Amen? And I can't think of any reason why I need to show him any mercy because I can't think of any time he's done me wrong. Now, Bailey, now I'm just <laughs> She didn't get my coffee this morning, so I have to be merciful to her. <laughs> Hallelujah. You can't give something that you don't have. You can't give mercy until you have mercy. Amen? Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. So the provision when you've been done wrong is that God gives you mercy. Then you're, you actually have mercy then to give to those that have done you wrong. Instead of looking for them to change, look for what God's doing in you when, when you get done wrong. Now, it doesn't mean that you, you look at it and say, well, you know, I deserved it. That, that's, not, that's not what I'm talking about. What I'm talking about is when somebody does me wrong, instead of looking at, well, well I, I think we ought, ought to examine ourselves. Did, did I do something to deserve this? Oftentimes you don't. Sometimes you do. If you do, make a change. Amen? Make it right. But if you can't think of anything you've done to deserve it, then start looking for the mercy of God to come in upon you. Amen? Start focusing on the mercy. In Hebrews chapter 4, it says that uh, verse uh, 14 says, Seeing then that we have a great high priest 
that is passed into the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our profession, for we have not a high priest which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities or weaknesses, but was in all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin. Let us therefore come boldly unto the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy. So where do you get mercy? From the throne of grace. Amen? Amen. You don't get it just by working up your mental attitude. You go to Jesus. Amen? Amen. You go to the throne of grace. That's where mercy comes. That's where you learn about the mercy of God. It was the mercy of God that sent Jesus to the cross. Amen? Amen. It was God's mercy that sent Jesus to the world. God so loved the world. God's love made him merciful. Parents understand this. Your child can do something wrong. You can get mad at them, but that your love will compel you to draw them back in. Amen? A parent shows mercy. God is the perfect parent. The Bible says that we're evil compared to God. God is a perfect parent. God's love compelled his mercy to send Jesus. Amen? So we obtain mercy, then we're able to give mercy. You can't give what you don't have. Now, that's my review. Number six, the sixth blessing or the sixth happiness, sixth phrase about happiness in the Beatitudes. Blessed, everybody say blessed, blessed. are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Say blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. So the condition is our heart not being pure or, or our heart be, beca- being made pure. In other words, we're living in a, a system without a lot of purity. The world is a mixed bag. And God wants us to be pure in heart. If we can become pure in heart, then we see God. We see more of God. The more purity of heart, the more we see God. Amen. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Now, look at James chapter 1. Verse Five, if any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God that gives to all men liberally. Notice that God's nature is to give. A lot of times we think that when we pray, we have to really beg and beseech and plead and cry. And and it's like we've got to do all these, go through all these things to convince God to give us something. We don't pray to convince God to give us something. God is already predisposed to give. We pray to line ourselves up with God's way of doing things and thinking. And we pray and we ask in faith. If any man lack wisdom, let him ask of God that gives to all men liberally and upbraideth not, and it shall be given him. But let him ask in faith, nothing wavering, for he that wavereth is like a wave of the sea driven by the wind and tossed. For let not that man think he shall receive anything of the Lord. A double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. When you're double-minded, it just means that there's a a lack of purity. Amen? When you mix one ingredient with another, that one ingredient may have been pure. When you mix something else with it, it's no longer pure. Amen? So we need to ask in faith without wavering. So you can have faith and have unbelief at the same time. So we need to have a purity. And that purity comes not by just saying, well, I'm going to get rid of unbelief. Uh, that, that's obviously what we need to do. But it, it's not that simple. You don't just say, well, unbelief, go away. And it goes away. That's not how it works. You get rid of unbelief by looking at the purity, by looking at the source of purity. 
In verse 16, it says, Do not err, my beloved brethren. Every good gift and every perfect gift, in other words, every pure gift, is from above and comes down from the Father of lights. Everybody say, the Father of lights. With whom there is no variableness, neither shadow of turning. Now think about this. Light is what enables you to see. A few years ago, <laughs> Rachel would be you know, trying to read something, and she'd say, it's, it's too dark in this house. I mean, we kept getting brighter lights and brighter lights. I mean, finally, it was almost like you'd have a spotlight. It's too dark in this house. <laughs> when you got the sun in your living room and you're still saying it's too dark, I finally said, Rachel, it's not too dark. It's your eyes. You got to do something. So she went and got glasses, and all of a sudden, it got brighter. <laughs> but when you think about it, even people with poor vision, if you can put more light on the, on the subject, you can see it better. I mean, I take my glasses off, and, and I may have a hard time reading. But if I get enough light on the subject, I can see it, even smaller print. Now, there's a limit to that because I need my glasses until my eyes are completely healed. Amen? But light is what enables us to see. Your eyes basically process and interpret light. That's what vision is all about. Everybody say, my eyes process and interpret light. And listen, with that in mind, think about what it says. Do not err, my beloved brethren. Every good and perfect gift or every pure gift comes from above and comes down from the Father of lights with whom is no variableness, neither shadow of turning. A shadow is just simply uh, light that has been blocked by an obstacle. A shadow is just, when you see a shadow, that you got a light, you got a obstacle here the shadow is what blocks the light so with God God removes the obstacles when we look to him instead of the obstacles when you look to God God purifies everything light purifies amen so God empowers you to see him with purity no obstacles Hebrews or 2nd Corinthians chapter 4 verse 1 Therefore, since we have this ministry as we have received mercy, everybody say mercy. So just like we've received mercy, we don't, do not lose heart. Amen? Blessed are the pure in heart. So again, it comes back to mercy. God's mercy gives us the ability to see him. We don't lose heart. But we have renounced the hidden things of shame not walking in craftiness nor handling the word of God deceitfully, but by manifestation of the truth, commending ourselves in it to every man's conscience in the sight of God. But even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing, whose minds the God of this age has blinded who do not believe, lest the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine on them. For we do not preach ourselves, but Jesus Christ the Lord and ourselves, your bondservants, for Jesus' sake. For it is God who commanded light to shine out of darkness, who has shone in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. How many of you want to see more God? Amen. We all need to see more of God. Well, start looking. Start looking to Jesus. It comes from the mercy of God. God's mercy has purified our hearts so that we can see God. Through Jesus, our hearts have been purified. In John, the, God, uh, the, the epistle of John, one of the epistles has said that if our heart condemns us, God is greater than our heart. And knows all things. And restores us back. Even when your heart condemns you, God is greater than your heart. I don't know about you. There have been times that I've been doing pretty good. And then all of a sudden I'll, I'll slip up and I'll do something or say something I shouldn't say or whatever. Allow my thoughts to wander in the direction they shouldn't go in. Don't look so holy when I start confessing my sins. You're all guilty too. <laughs> but when that happens God is greater than my heart 
Everybody say, God is greater than my heart. The mercy of God is greater than anything. There, uh, there's a song, I think David Crowder sings a song, that there's no, no hurt, no pain on earth that heaven can't heal. There's no condition in your heart that heaven can't heal. There's no bitterness in your heart that heaven can't purify and make clean. All of us have been through things, and all of us have things that, that could divide our hearts. But there's nothing that we're going through that heaven can't heal. Amen? We just have to look to the source. Let God shine on us. The more we allow God to shine, we, every good gift and every perfect gift comes from the Father of lights. And that he shines that light on us, and if we'll allow him to shine that light on us, then we see him. When you see God, really nothing else matters so much. You know, when, you, when you're going through a hard time, going through, you know, somebody makes you mad, you get upset, but one glimpse of God just kind of sets everything in order. The things that you were mad about, just they don't seem to be that important anymore. The things that you were questioning, things that you were hurt about, they just don't seem to be that big anymore because God is so much bigger. So we just need to keep looking to the light. Amen? Well, I was going to cover some more, but is that good enough for you? Hallelujah. That bless you today? Everybody say, God is good.